This is part one of a two-part conversation between the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement Director, Dr. Michael Ray Trice and Dr. John Borelli. In this episode, Dr. Trice and Dr. Borelli discuss Vatican II, interreligious dialogue, and partnership. Take a listen. I'm Michael Reed Trice with the Religion of Theo Lab at the Center for Religious Wisdom and World Affairs, Seattle University. And today we're in conversation with Dr. John Borelli, a historian of religions and a theologian who serves as special assistant for Catholic identity and dialogue to President John DeGoya at Georgetown University. Dr. Borelli has been at Georgetown since 2000, where he teaches, manages conference and events, coordinates dialogues, facilitates workshops, promotes university relations, and so much more in terms of his connection to the Holy See or the Vatican. Dr. Borelli served for 16 years from 1987 to 2003 as Associate Director of the Secretariat for Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Staffing the Bishop's Subcommittee on Interreligious Dialogue for those years, he managed three ongoing dialogues with Muslims, one with Buddhists, and one with Hindus and other religious projects. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Borelli. Thank you, Michael. Let's begin first with what we understand often in shorthand is referred to as Vatican II, which is to say how we understand the church's influence in the modern world. A lot is said about this. A lot is said about the role of the Catholic Church or all of the Christian uh, churches in the the modern world and some of the challenges that are posed by that. What is Vatican II and why do you think that's addressing challenges and even as a breakthrough moment for Christianity? Very good. Quite a sweeping question. And let me even be a little more sweeping after your introduction. <laughs> My professional life did not begin in 1987, so I'm deep back into the 20th century. I received my doctorate in 76, the bicentennial year in history, religions, and theology at Fordham. And I taught full-time in New York uh, at Fordham, my final year of graduate work, and at the College of Mount St. Vincent, where I ran religious studies for 11 years. So, I, And then that's when I got involved in ecumenical and interreligious relations through the Archdiocese of New York. The 20th century has often been referred to as the century of the church. In some ways, the beginning of the 20th century was the freedom of the church in Germany from, you know, the German oppression of church affairs. But also it was a century of the flowering of the church because the ecumenical movement was truly a 20th century movement. There were mo- there were uh, stirrings in the 19th century that you can find that led into the 20th. But we look at 1910 and this missionary conference in Edinburgh as, as a sort of formal beginning when Protestants, and not all, uh, the not too many Anglicans, uh, but a a good many evangelical Protestants were there, a few missionaries from around the world, not too many people of other than European and American descent, but still they realized that they were propagating the division of Protestantism in the mission. And that was a scandal because they all agreed with the New Testament passages. And there are several that Christians should be one, and that Christ prayed on the night where he died, that we may all be one. And that St. Paul urged the community at Corinth, for example, to be one. And then you see it in the later New Testament text, Ephesians, of this the oneness of the church. And we confess the church is one. And so uh, so then, you know, faith and order, missionary movements, life and works in the 20s, interrupted by World War II. So two wars interrupted the movement, World War One in Europe and World War Two. After World War Two, all of these faith and order, life and works and mission eventually came together in the World Council of Churches, 1948. So we had a new a kind of model, a council of churches that was not a super church, but represented the diversity of churches. Now, most mostly Protestants and Anglicans, and some Orthodox, particularly those Orthodox who were shut out of Soviet-controlled Eastern Europe. And so they were involved, and that kind of gave a connection to the Eastern churches that were under Soviet control. And some of the churches of the Middle East began to get interested. So the World Council started all of this in 48. And the next big ecumenical move was, in fact, this Vatican II, the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council that Pope John the Twenty Third called to the surprise of all. Uh, soon after he was elected, he was in many ways a surprise candidate, although if you really get into the weeds about it, there weren't too many options and very few cardinals, and uh, he was really one of the most competent ones available. So, uh, and he declared he wanted to call a council. He wasn't quite sure what it would do, but he wanted it to be ecumenical, that is, to be some kind of outreach to other Christians, and to be edifying for the church, the Catholic people as a whole, and all Christian people. Truly, it was going to be a reform council. People already knew that there was a liturgical movement going on and reform was due there too. 
But John called, Pope John the 23rd called this. He set up a secretariat for promoting Christian unity. Uh, already the active Catholic humanist got behind this and suggested this, and he put it, Cardinal Bea, Augustine Bea, a very well-esteemed biblical scholar, elderly Jesuit uh, in, in Rome, who he made a cardinal in his first uh, consistory after his election, uh, and put him in charge of Christian unity. And so Vatican II not only hosted representatives of various churches, and they were there in a prominent place for all the working sessions, and they were gathered by the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity to comment on the documents, the relevant documents. So they had some input into the writing of the key documents that the Secretariat was doing. And in fact, the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity was the most successful of all the commissions. It did a decree on ecumenism. It did a declaration called Nostra Etate uh, uh, on interreligious dialogue. It was really directed on correcting relations with the Jews and acknowledging uh, that uh, the church uh, Christians had been behind much persecution of Jews. So it took that first step, but it expanded into interreligious relations as a whole. One on religious liberty. Why? Because the general secretary of the World Council of Churches told Cardinal Bea from the start, you can say what you want to about ecumenism. Unless you say something about religious liberty, nobody will buy it. In other words, that the freedom to be in the church of your choice. And we, of course, acknowledge this in the United States, but it wasn't always the case in countries with established churches. It was so successful that, by the way, the only countries with established churches are Protestant countries now, no longer Catholic countries. And they had input on the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation because of the Protestant concern about the relations between scripture and tradition. So, and many of those who worked on the, the document on the church went to work helping with the document on ecumenism. They were passed at the same time, and it was acknowledged the ecumenical interpretation of the church would be through this decree. So that was a big event. And so from the time that the Roman Catholic Church, the elephant, got into the rowboat of ecumenism, um, things changed. We had far more bilateral dialogues. Uh, that's what the Catholic Church promoted, Catholic Lutheran, Catholic Anglican, Catholic Orthodox, Catholic Methodist. It was going on to some extent, but the World Council was doing conciliar dialogue, many churches gathering in faith and order. And the Catholic Church says, we're too big to join the World Council. We would upset your formula for representation. We would control it. So let's not join it. Let's have a joint working group and we'll join faith and order. We'll send theologians to that. So um, by century's end, by century's end, as we were on the eve of 2000, in 1999, Lutherans and Catholics laid to rest the doctrinal dispute on justification, which caused the Reformation in 1517. And they signed the joint declaration on the document of justification, on the doctrine of justification, on October 31st, 1999. And Protestants will know October 31st, it's the day associated with Martin Luther. Whether he tacked his 95 theses on the door, he certainly mailed them and posted them to his regent that he wanted to debate these issues about justification and indulgences and everything. But Reformation Sunday, Protestants will remember as the day when this Reformation was celebrated. Well, and you, you, well, and you've mentioned, you know, working with evangelicals in particular in your work, even before the end of 2017, you'd co-published Catholics and Evangelicals for the Common Good with Ron Sider as the founder of Evangelicals for Social Action. How important is that conversation today in the context of, of the United States and our own? Kind of well, I think it's very important idea. in many ways, the, the conversation between evangelicals, Pentecostals, and mainline Christians, Catholics, and Protestants and Anglicans in the ecumenical movement. Um, individually, evangelicals and Pentecostals have produced, have participated in dialogues, formal dialogues. And to some extent, there have been conversations with the Evangelical Alliance, the World Evangelical Alliance, and the World Council in the Vatican. They did a kind of statement on proselytism not too long ago, I think 10 or 20 years, 10 years ago, maybe. Uh, so some effort, but it's mostly been individuals. I think we've got a lot in common. Many evangelicals 
really enjoy the Catholic social tradition, and they want to talk about that. And that was the basis of that dialogue we had uh, that involved Georgetown University and, uh, and various evangelicals, uh, in particular, Eastern Mennonite University outside of Philadelphia, where Ron Sider was. Can, that, can those conversations be of assistance to some of the, the divisions that we see in society now? Do you think between Pentecostals, more, those more on the far right, let's say far right leaning evangelicals or far right leaning Catholics as well? Yes, well, we see a split among evangelicals going on for a few years now. Black evangelicals and white evangelicals, but also among white evangelicals. And we're beginning to see now uh, white women evangelical scholars beginning to take exception to some of the doctrines that have been prescribed by evangelicals like complementarianism on defining the roles of men and women in the church and so forth. So, yes, I think there is a role here. Um, We can talk about social teaching and social doctrine and how we might work together. Talking about the issues of doctrine that are important is very difficult because it involves scripture interpretation. Um, it's, it was always difficult to keep a conversation going with the Southern Baptists. We had a few conversations at the Bishop's Conference, uh, but they had to be pretty well defined. And we called them conversations instead of dialogues, lest uh, they be criticized by their compatriots for, for compromising. Dialogue is not compromised. Well, and for the listener, what's the what's what's the issue with interpreting scripture for those who may not be familiar with different interpretations of scripture? That right, are, using, uh, using historical criticism to read scripture. I mean, if evangelicals generally believe that scripture is inerrant. Um, in a way, um, we say that scripture is revelation, you know, uh, and in a way, we can agree that it's inerrant in the sense that there is a divine revelation there. But the important thing is understanding what that is and also understanding the historical context of language, uh, how the text was used, how it's related to other scriptural passages, uh, these kinds of things. Um, And there's been some progress made in this regard, but um, you've got a kind of independence among evangelicals and Pentecostals that they wish to maintain that's often around the pastor himself who has organized the church around himself. And so um, you see you see moments open up. But for example, the big issues that we are facing uh, in regards uh, the earth and everything, uh, um, ecology, uh, climate change, uh, the social structures, racism, we have to have these conversations. And um, we have to end this sort of us and them thinking. That's that's what really has hurt us. If we can reach agreement on the doctrine of justification, which defined us differently as Lutherans and Catholics, then our very using a kind of identity theology was at risk. We had to adjust who we were. Uh, and uh, that's been a big step. Um, but the fact that Lutherans were comfortable going to Rome and entering into conversations with Pope Francis and, and commemorating the fifth centenary, centenary with him was an extraordinary move in that direction. So, um, so anyway, yes, I think we've got a, those three camps have got to somehow now Pope Francis, his experience in Argentina was such that he already was reaching out to Pentecostals um, in some rather famous incidents that took place. And he and his ecumenical partners down there also expressed when he was elected Pope how he much appreciated who they were. So when he got to Rome, he wanted to press for ecumenism as well as interreligious dialogue. <clears throat> um, but he was um, the first pope to go to the Waldensians, who are that particular uh, Italian uh, form of evangelical church that goes back to uh, the Reformation. The first one to go to them. He also went to various to a Pentecostal community in another place in in Italy and spoke. Um, He received his uh, friends, his Pentecostal friends, while he was there in Rome. He still promotes the ecumenical dialogue and is very strongly promoting it. Um, But he's he's expanded this understanding to accompaniment. Let us journey together. Let us join. We Christians are on the journey together. We share so much in common. We can nourish one another. 
through scriptural reflection together and through various ways that we can pray and worship together. Let's accompany one another. And that's been his sort of new model. But he's expanded it into religious relations, too. Well, in his encyclical, um, Laudato Si, yes. from 2015, two years before the uh, the anniversary of the 500th year of the, the start of the Reformation that you've identified, on you know, in that in that encyclical, he notes the um, the importance of a kind of integrated ecology in both our personal lives in the church within society, and then later follows up on many of these principal themes in Fratelli Tutti. And is this is this this sense of uh, of a papal what's the word that you used accompaniment? Yes. Is this the sense of papal accompaniment that he thinks should be integrated in in all of our lives across churches? And is that kind of advanced in how he's thinking about ecumenical and religious dialogue as well? I think so. I mean, he's he wanted to focus on on climate change and the effects of climate change. He even had a special synod uh, on the Amazon where he brought people together. But these also, these messages, he wants to uh, uh, do this ecumenically. So with Laudato Si, in particular, he talked about Par- uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, the ecumenical patriarch, who has long been called the Green Patriarch, who was well ahead of him on promoting this issue. He brought him into the conversation on this, and their relationship helped him and inspired him as he worked on Laudato Si. Um, Patriarch Bartholomew actually was in Rome uh, for his installation, for Pope Francis' installation, which was a sort of breakthrough. So they formed a partnership then, and then they met again in 2015, I think it was. It was supposed to be 2014. But I think it was delayed. Maybe, maybe it was later in fourteen. I have to. I don't have the exact year. It, it was the fiftieth anniversary of the embrace of Pope Paul the Sixth during Vatican II with Patriarch Athenagoras. That Could you say place. a word about why that's so significant for the listener who may not know about the history? Mm-hmm. You and I know it, but it's it's a profound history. After Vatican II started in nineteen sixty two, it went through a tumultuous first session. Um, there were. There were drafts put forward and agenda put forward by the Roman officials, but the residential bishops rejected them, rejected text after text. The residential bishops took charge. Uh, Pope John hadn't worked out a strategy. He knew he had to work with the Roman Curia, the people in his offices there in the Vatican, if he was going to pull this off. But he knew the residential bishops, he trusted them, would take charge, and they far outnumbered, and the cardinals far outnumbered the cardinals in Rome. And so they took charge to the agenda. And um, at the end of that first session, there was agreement. Let us focus on the church. Let us focus on our self-understanding as church and our relationship as church to the world. Let's do this twofold aspect. of the, And this was kind of in December of 62. The council met in the fall months of four years. And at the end, in early December, uh, there was a general consensus. That's the direction we are going. Pope John dies then, following June. He writes his great encyclical, Peace on Earth, Pachum and Terrace, which is a response to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we are discovering even more, how really fortunate we were that we didn't lapse into a nuclear exchange back in October of 1962. But Pope John told his writers, I want a document that both Premier Khrushchev of Russia, for the Soviet Union, and President John F. Kennedy will read. And it was, in many ways, his last will and testament. It came out in May, and he died the following June, the next month, of cancer. And there was a gathering of the cardinals in Rome, and there was an election of the obvious liberal who was promoting the council, uh, Cardinal Montini of Milan, who became Pope Paul VI. And he said, indeed, the church, he had even spoken on this, will be our controlling theme. The church in itself, the church as it relates to the world, ecumenically to other Christians, interreligiously to other believers, and to the world as a whole, to all people. So the church in itself as a sacrament, the church in relationship to all people. And um, that was in um, 63, fall of 63. So some progress was made. He also said, I have this secretary for Christian unity. In due time, I'm going to have another secretariat that relates to other people of other religions. I'll get around to it. Then at the end, in December of 63, he announced to the bishops on the last day of the meeting before they went home uh, for the end of the second session, I've decided I'm going to be a pilgrim to the Holy 
to the Holy Land. I'm going to the Holy Land. And the bishops jumped up in, in applause and in that way sort of endorsed it. And so he went in January of 64. Well, right away, the Greek Orthodox patriarch, Athenagoras, got hold of this and said, let's make this an ecumenical journey. Let's meet. And so it wasn't a private uh, pilgrimage as the Pope had originally intended. It became an ecumenical event, not only with pa the patriarch of Constantinople, but also the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem, as well as the Armenian Patriarch who's there in Jerusalem and others. So there was a big ecumenical gathering that took place there. And um, I just have to stop this. And um, in the meantime, um, uh, they embraced in this meeting, which ended centuries, almost a thousand years of rupture between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. And so uh, that extraordinary event, which led to other changes, uh, in fact, on the last day of Vatican II, the Pope and the Patriarch lifted the mutual ex excommunications of the 11th century that they had hurled at each other, their predecessors. Uh, so, And so it was important for uh, Bartholomew and Francis to remember this 50 years later. Pope Francis, though, brought his two friends from Argentina, Rabbi Skorka and uh, Abud, his, his Muslim friend, uh, so that he said, we're all going to go together. And so that was a remarkable thing, too. His close rabbi friend who remains very close and his close Muslim friend from days in Buenos Aires. And it was a, a kind of a remarkable image of his uh, visit there. So, so Laudato Si was in many ways inspired by his relationship with Bartholomew. But it's, there are many technical things in Laudato Si about uh, engagement with science, about engagement with, um, there's a, the earth is for all. And we have to preserve the earth as well as help those whose survival depends upon change because of climate change. In other words, we've got to address the poor and the migrants who are victims of climate change as much as anything. That it's not just a matter of saving the earth, but it's a matter of taking care of all of humanity at the same time. You have been listening to the Religica Theo Lab podcast in the Center for Ecumenical and Interreligious Engagement at Seattle University. To learn more about the center's work and for resources to be used in local communities, visit us at seattleu.edu slash the center.